Hi there, and I hope you are having a wonderful day. My day turned out to be very exciting when a brother in Christ pointed out a video to me that was made almost three years ago, but which would seem to support the understanding provided in the previous video I uploaded. I find it very encouraging and at the same time also very alarming when I encounter double confirmations as this always points me to the possibility that our Heavenly Father wants us to take notice of what is shared and to remove doubts regarding our understanding. Now I am sinful, fallible and full of imperfections and my understanding could be wrong and this could simply be a coincidence. But I feel I have to share this with you but before I share the video in which this prophecy is given I would just like to position this for those who may not be familiar with the information and to provide additional clarity to what was discussed earlier. In the previous video I pointed out how the Revelation 12 sign may possibly be understood by connecting it to the pattern in which God made an everlasting covenant with Abraham and promised Abraham and Sarah to give them a child in their old age. Why should we consider looking for patterns in the word to understand what we read in other sections of the word which apply to the times that we live in? That instruction is given to us in the following passage. The thing that hath been it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. God has provided patterns in His Word that we have to apply to what we read in order to obtain a proper understanding. One example is to apply the pattern of the three-part harvest and the three-part temple to what is referred to as the first resurrection in order to obtain the correct understanding and I've discussed this to great lengths in previous videos. How many knew that Isaac's birth was promised to Abram and Sarah exactly one year prior and occurred on an appointed time as can be seen in this passage? But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. It is also interesting that this section gives a specific focus on an aspect that many may overlook. We have to keep in mind that every little detail in the word of God was put there for our understanding. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes, and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Why is there such a focus on the tent that Abraham and Sarah stayed in when this encounter took place? Why mention the tent five times? Could it be that the set time for which Isaac's birth was pronounced would have to do with the Feast of Tents or Tabernacles? When we consider the position of the Revelation 12 sign on a timeline and add exactly one year to its occurrence, it brings us to September 23, 2018. And in 2018, the first day of Sukkot started on the evening of September 23rd, exactly one year after the sign occurred. If we then consider this pattern that was given to Abraham and apply it to the Revelation 12 sign, it could then represent the same one-year warning that pointed to the birth of the man-child on September 23, 2018, which just happened to coincide exactly with the start of the Feast of Tabernacles in Israel. As I have pointed out in an earlier video, this is also the day on which Jesus was transfigured on the mountain where Peter offered to build three tabernacles or tents on the eve of Sukkot. The everlasting covenant that God made with Abraham would also seem to be connecting the Revelation 12 sign that involves the land of Canaan, which God gave to Israel for an everlasting covenant, and for which God took sole responsibility when this covenant was struck, while Abraham was in a deep sleep, 
as can be seen in the following passages. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace, and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Trump's deal of the century would seem to be focused on creating a two-state solution, where if Israel agrees to this deal, they would effectively be breaking the everlasting covenant that God made with Abraham on his behalf, leading to what we read in Isaiah 24. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. The Revelation 12 sign does not end at the birth of the man-child. There is more information to consider. This passage continues to tell us that the child that was born was caught up to the throne of God, and there is more for us to learn regarding this aspect from the Word. Based on the instructions given in Leviticus, any man-child who was born in Israel could only be presented to the Lord in the sanctuary forty days after his birth, once the mother had completed the days of her purification. We see the following written. Chapter 12 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed, and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation of her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised, and she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary, until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled, for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, who shall offer it before the Lord, and make an atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood." So the earliest point at which a man-child would be allowed to be presented before the Lord in his temple after birth, when we combine the information considered, would be 40 days after the birth. In 2018 this would be November 2nd, which is 40 days after September 23rd, if we use a 365-day calendar. And as this is an uncertainty, we should look for a window of opportunity around November the 2nd, when applying our understanding to this model. Now moving on to the possible confirmation of this understanding in a video clip given by Ken Peters, who was also shown what the tribulation will be like earlier in his life, he received the prophecy that I will share with you today on November 1st in 2015, as you will hear in the clip. And from what I can tell, I do not think Ken at the time understood some of the linkages between what was said in this prophecy and that which the Lord has now shown us in these days. Now many will immediately focus on attacking Ken's weaknesses, or would say things to discredit him. However, we have to remember that God only has sinful and fallible people to use when he shares a message with us. We are all imperfect and fall short of the glory of God. But knowing that we do, we have to look past that to what God is trying to tell us and realize that God's strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We are also told to test all things and to keep that which is good, and in this clip, Ken tells his audience to do the same. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 
My focus is to be a Berean and to be objective and to look at what is said and to compare it with what is written in the word and to see if there are any contradictions which would indicate to me that the message is not from God. I could not find any contradictions in what was said and where it may seem to some that the message requires us to do works, this would be a wrong interpretation of what is said if you listen carefully and to what he says in the rest of the sermon which I have left out. The Bible clearly shows us what it means to overcome the world, and there is a lot of emphasis put on this aspect in this prophecy, which John tells us is to have faith in Jesus alone. When Ken tells us that God wants 100% from us, and not just 50%, it means he wants us to trust him 100% and not to add 50% of our own works to our faith in Jesus to obtain righteousness before our Heavenly Father. Carefully listen to what is said with regards to timing and dates in this prophecy, and I will also highlight some of the aspects that are clearly linked to the understanding and insight shared with you in recent videos. I hope this will bless you as I was blessed by this, and that it will renew your strength as we continue to watch for the return of our Lord which would seem to be rapidly approaching us. So this week when I've been praying, he told me to give it to you. He said, it's for you. There's nothing in it specific uh, to our fellowship except one admonition. But I feel compelled to give it to you. I'm telling you right now, I could close this and prophesy to you something else from God too. But I feel compelled to give you this. So I don't know... I'm not going to try to remanufacture or, 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 or um, you know, make another moment happen because I think that's wrong. So I'm just going to read it to the best of my ability. I asked if they could put it up. I see that they're getting it up. If you want to follow it, sometimes that helps me instead of just hearing. You have heard my word many times. You have heard my scriptures speak to your hearts. And yet you have heard this one over and over. But I say to you today... It shall be alive in your hearing. For I, the Lord, will send you help from the sanctuary. Yes, I say I will send you help from the sanctuary, from the holy place of my habitation. I have sent out international angels, heavenly hosts that will begin to make you strong again. For my people and my church, those of a remnant, have been in a severe testing and trial. For I have been preparing them for eternal things to come. And many would say, Lord, why, why, why? But I am saying that I am preparing you for an eternal weight of glory. That blows me away. So that when you put on the robe of righteousness and stand before my son, that you will know that truly you have done well that you will not think you got in by the skin of your teeth, but you will know that you served the king well. You know that you overcame. For did not my son say seven times in the great revelation to John that those who overcome, 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 overcome, shall they not rule and reign with me? Is this not your destiny? Is this not what each and every one of you are called to be and to do? So I'm telling you today that help from the sanctuary is being sent to you right now. That the journey will get easier. And that the battle, though it may rage upon this earth, that you will be strong and glorious. That you will be filled with might. That you will be filled with great faith. For truly my spirit has chosen each and every one of you to be overcomers. But this is not automatic. This is not something that just happens. This is something that is the outpouring of your continual fight. And did not Paul say to you, fight the good fight of faith? I am strengthening your arms today. I am strengthening your feeble knees. For some of you today, those sins that have easily beset you are being removed. They're being pushed away. For I, the Lord God, have chosen you as a special people. This is Jubilee. I have chosen you as a treasured people. But more than that, I have chosen you to be a feared people. 
And the fear of my name will fall upon my church again. And this earth and its inhabitants will know that I have rose up mightily among my own. O gathering, O jubilee, says the Lord, be strong in this hour. Do not shrink back from the trials, but face off with the adversary, knowing that I, the Lord, are raising your arms like Moses when Ur and Aaron lifted up his arms. Today, my angelic hosts are lifting up your arms. They're beginning to do things that you cannot do on your own. They're beginning to bring reconciliation and restoration. You will see a sweeping across America in the next three years. You will see staggering, staggering issues challenging lives. You will see great devastation upon your land and many foreign lands. For the wrath of God is beginning in the earth against the unjust, against those who refuse my good news. But my people, you are in a safe place. You are in a very, very safe place with me. You must not fear the upheaval of nations. You must not fear the moving of nations into the Middle East. You must not fear what is going to happen upon Israel. You must not fear what will happen to America. For in the midst of chaos, I, the Lord, rule. I rule in the midst of downturns. I rule in the midst of trials. For my people are special, and you must understand that I chose you above others. That when you responded to my son's atonement, that I made a special compact with you, a covenant that cannot be broken. This is not your hour of defeat, but this is your hour to rise up and be strong. Like a great shipmast in the midst of a terrible storm, shall you be unwavered and unmoving. And I will pilot each and every one of you as you surrender to the working of my spirit. As you decree today, do you not believe that I have all these things for you? But you must be an obedient people to me. You must not give place to lip service. The things that I say in my word, you must do in this hour. Never forget my throne of grace. Even in your rebellion, my throne of grace will give you mercy and empower you to become those of a glorious nature. The Lord says, stop being distracted. I want distractions put away from each of you. For some of you, it's the amount of time you spend in things that are not eternal. Look at your lives, children, today. My Father is preparing great crowns of rewards. And very, very soon, I will be your soon coming King. But for some of my people, the day will catch them unaware. And they will not be prepared. And they will be like a man who went on a journey without food, without clothing, and came into a storm and suffered great loss. You must hear me, my children, for my spirit beckons each of you now. This is not a time any longer to give me 50%. You must give me 100, for you are called to be overcomers. You have been destined by my Father to sit with me, excuse me, to sit with the 24 elders and make great decisions and heavenly strategies in the new earth and heaven to come. Do you not see that you are called to things beyond this limitation on earth? Come on, my people. You must see into a new dimension. You must look beyond your trials and your problems. And the Lord says you must no longer be complainers like Israel. For the Lord says this world will devour the complainers. But those who are clothed with the fire of my spirit, they cannot be consumed. They cannot be moved and shaken. Soon you will begin to understand the very power of your worship and how it shatters spiritual realms and breaks principalities' backs. For great darkness has been sent upon your land. For those in high civil authorities have given this nation over to the ways of darkness. But I, the Lord, will redeem my people. I did not come to redeem governments. I did not come to exalt nations. I came to covenant with the people that are called out. So be ye the called out ones, says the Lord. And make a fresh covenant with me today. Rend your hearts before me, all of you, regardless of how well you know me, or how long you've walked with me, or how deep you've gone with me, or how you've served me. This is a holy day, a holy day among you, that you will never forget as time progresses. As time begins to come faster and faster, 
You will look back on this day, the first day of this month, November. You will look back even as the clocks were changed and time began anew. And you will say, that was the day of a holy convocation. The day the Lord set me aside and chose me for a special work. Rend your heart, says the spirit of grace and supplication. The Lord says you have called times of prayer here. They must be adhered to by more and more. Some of you are ignoring the spirit of grace and you find excuses and alibis with which to avoid spiritual depth. But a great tide is coming, like a tidal wave that pulls people out to the seas. Some of my people will begin to be pulled out to the sea and never return to the depth of their first love. I don't want that to be me. I do believe in grace, but I believe the Bible says that grace was given that we might not sin. And you know, idolatry is sin. When we only give him 50% and he's given everything, that's idolatry. If we serve ourselves and not him, that's idolatry. And I know that prophets don't like to say in modern times that God's people have a problem with idolatry. I do. Sometimes my grandson is an idol to me. Sometimes I ignore the Holy Spirit to pray so I can play with my grandson. I'm hoping someday that the confession of my weaknesses will spur the people of God to move their hearts closer to him. Because I want to tell you something, whether you hear the rest of this or not. We've been sold a bill of goods about once saved, always saved. There are people that are going to never return to their first love. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you will die in your sin. He pronounced it to them clearly. You will die in sin. That's eternal. That's the second death. Do not ignore the beckoning of my spirit this day. This land is being weighed in the balances. There must be great prayer. Prophets have come to you and spoken that your prayers will dictate the next three years. It is time you become a serious people. For Satan has desired to send scorpions and demonic beings to bite the people of God, to get them to doubt my goodness through a lack of separation. This is a day of separation, says the Lord. I called you to be a sanctified people. Come out. Come out from this world and be separate. Set aside these things that trip you up and do the things that make your Lord a Lord of pleasure for you. A master who smiles when he looks upon you when you work. No, your work shall never ever obtain your salvation. But your earthly works will determine the pleasure of the king and where you are in the midst of his presence. For some of you, the spirit of grace is saying, kneel. Others, he is saying to your hearts, lift your hands high and pledge your allegiance to the Lamb of God. Pledge your allegiance to the kingdom that comes. The Lord says, in three years, you will see the upheaval of all nations. I'm either the biggest false prophet that ever lived, or I'm the stupidest prophet to ever say that. The upheaval of all nation, all nations in three years. If you've studied end time Bible prophecies, you know exactly what that's pointing to. It has to be the return of Christ. In three years, you will see the upheaval of all nations, and you will see that even national names will be gone forever. They're about to wipe the name Syria off the face of the earth. Do you know that Assyria is one of the original nations of the world? It's about to disappear. Iraq is about to disappear. The land of Shinar. Some of you act as though these things can never happen in this modern era. But if you look back many times throughout the history of man, Nations have lost their names, their influence. And these things are happening now, says the Lord. And you must be ready. And you must remember what Paul said to you, that having done all to stand, 
you must stand with your loins girded with truth. Do not let deception come. Do not buy into lies. Remember what my son said before he departed this earth to sit at the right hand of my glory. He said, beware and let no man deceive you. Guard your hearts, my children. Do well and cause your father to release a great smile of his pleasure upon you. Go before him this day without leaders, without worshipers, and tell him, these are my areas, these are my things, these are my fears, these are my failures. And he will raise you up, for in your humility you shall be exalted. For in the, for in the end of times you will see the pride of man like never before. You will see the obstinance of men's heart, hearts, excuse me, contending for that which is bound for Gehenna. But for my people, as Isaiah prophesied, arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. You know, you can't remanufacture a live effect. It's kind of like a recording almost, you know. You really can't do it. But what you can do is, with wisdom, you can obviously judge this prophecy. You must do that because that's biblical. If your leadership and your pastor judges this word as accurate, you will.